So like I mentioned before, it's the Professional Services Forecast and Event uh, 2021. Um, so what we do here is actually invite uh, agency partners to come, uh, talk about their forecast here a little bit, um, what's in the future, maybe a possible uh, couple of opportunities that also might be on the list here. Um, so let's get to the agenda real quick here and see what we have. So first off, we're going to have a presentation uh, by the Department of Transportation um, on their forecasting. Um, then after that, um, we're going to have Environmental, Environmental Protection Agency um, also do a presentation. Um, then I myself, as the host, um, I'm just going to do a really, really brief uh, forecasting uh, presentation on kind of the tools and dashboards that are out there that our industry partners uh, can use to actually create their own um, kind of forecasting um, uh, table if they would like. And then of course, there is also gonna be a closing with just some kind of other housekeeping items that I would like to discuss. Um, but uh, before I take anybody else's more time, I know everybody wants to get into the meat of the actual presentation. So let me introduce you to our first presenter from DOD, uh, Meth, uh, uh, Ms. Uh, Bethany Petrovsky. Uh, she is actually the current director for the Office of Acquisition Management at the Federal Railroad Administration. Um, uh, Bethany actually began her career at the Naval Sea Systems Command as a contract specialist. Um, she ended up working at the Department of Homeland Security as a team lead contracting officer for the Coast Guard and TSA. Um, then she actually became an assistant director for detention management at the U.S. Immigration and Customs Enforcement Agency. Um, Bethany also joined the Department of Interior's Business Center as the Division Chief of Acquisition Policy and Competition Advocate. Um, Bethany was also a professor at contract management at the Defense Acquisition University and taught Daiwa, Daiwa level two and three contract courses. We are so lucky today to have Bethany join us today with the vast amount of experience um, she has, and I can't wait what, uh, in store for her presentation from uh, Department of Transportation. I'll let you uh, take it over, Bethany. Let me stop sharing my screen, and I'll let you go ahead and uh, let you start sharing your presentation. All right, thank you so much. Let me get the screen up here in full presentation mode. Here we go. Okay, can everybody see the presentation? Looks good, I can see it on my side. Awesome, thank you. Well, thank you everyone. Um, as Bounce mentioned, my name is Bethany Petrovsky. I'm actually relatively new to DOT. Uh, you can tell from my bio, I uh, enjoy working at a variety of the different federal agencies. So um, I'm happy to also share with you some of my experiences and do some comparison and contrasting as well uh, as we walk through this presentation. Um, I'm also excited to uh, let you know that one of my colleagues, Ms. Christina Galifaro, is also uh, here with me. She is here to keep me uh, on track with some of the data analytics that we're going to be sharing today. Um, so if there's questions on that, you know, I'll probably pass that over. But I'm really hoping that um, you all will enjoy this presentation. Our whole goal today is to really walk through with you what DOT is doing in this space. Um, it is something that we're very passionate about. Uh, FRA was lucky enough to be selected as one of the um, category managers for this particular uh, you know, category in professional services. We do have some of our other agencies, sister agencies who've taken the lead on things like IT and whatnot. Um, so I'm sure there'll be other uh, presentations that you can uh, participate in. Uh, with that said, I'm gonna talk to you a little bit today about some of the data analytics that we've done. Um, I'm gonna give you an overview of how we're doing in various categories. And then of course, share with you some of the upcoming opportunities that we have. And the whole idea here is, we wanna tell you exactly where we're going and also help hopefully present enough information that will allow you to strategically focus on the various different agencies within DOT and position your firms to hopefully um, help us execute our mission here at uh, DOT. So with that, I'm gonna get started here. Um, we're pursuing you know, managed spend across um, DOT as you know, consistent with the rest of the federal government. Um, we have these three, you know, goals that we set out for ourselves, you know, especially with continuous access to services. But I really want to emphasize where we're, we're really focusing on is probably the first two bullets that you see there, the greater strength in negotiation. Obviously, if we can consolidate our requirements, um, we can achieve better purchasing power, hopefully obtain better discounts, um, you know, better value for the government. And that, that's not coming as a surprise based on, um, you know, things that, either the administration is talking about, or even with uh, you know, budget cuts as we've, as we've seen over time. 
Um, I will talk a little bit about the pending infrastructure bill, which I'm sure you guys have been following in the press um, and how that may potentially play out with our professional services, but I'll do that in a, in a further slide. One of the other things um, that our group in particular is really focusing in on are these efficiencies that can be gained from purchasing through what we call simplified access to contract vehicles. The idea being if we can, if we can leverage tier two vehicles, if we can leverage already established vehicles, BPAs that have already been put in place or federal supply schedules, the idea is that it'll take us less time, we'll obviously get things on contract faster, and there's a whole host of benefits uh, that can be gained from that. And so you'll see when I'm talking about further opportunities at the end of the presentation, how that's playing into some of our acquisition strategies. So as a nice overview, we've spent a lot of time doing data analytics. Christine and her team have really been working hard on the last year to get our hands around what it is that we've been doing or the department's been doing, especially over the last five years. So here you can see from this slide that we've done about $2.8 billion in professional services. That's a tremendous amount, especially for an agency of this size. Are we on the scale of the DOD? No, um, but we're certainly a powerhouse when it comes to professional services. And I think it's a great fit with us partnering with GSA on some of their upcoming initiatives. So we can really you know, be active in this space and take advantage of everything that they have to offer. You see that we've got about $555 million annually. And you'll see this throughout our presentation. DOT calls our sub agencies modes. Modes, why do you ask? Well, modes, modes of transportation. So things like Federal Railroad Administration happens to be a mode and we're tied to the rail, right? Makes sense. Um, so what you'll see here is every mode actually is involved in purchasing professional services. That's a good news story for obviously DOT and that's a good news story for, um, for private industry. We don't have a single particular buyer or outlier in the area, everybody's participating, but you will see there that we have three that actually make up about 64% of the spend. So there are some agencies that are more, um, more involved or, or have more of these types of requirements than others. Now, when it comes to category management opportunities, you can see that we have a lot of room to grow in this area. And that can be particularly exciting, especially for um, my group here at FRA, because we're getting to really develop the, the space and look for those opportunities to gain efficiencies, leverage buying power, et cetera. Um, so you can see here that we have made some improvement in using the tier two or best in class contract vehicles in this space. It's up from about 28.6% to 30%, but obviously that means we have a ways to go. Um, and our leadership at the department is very, very committed to moving that lever. Um, we do a lot of full and open competition. You can see they're about 63%. Um, and for FY21, the target was to, to do about $255 million worth and to get that spend under management, you know, to get that achievable goal. Um, as of June, based on the numbers that we're seeing, we're about 24.5% of achieving that particular goal. Is there cause for concern? I wouldn't say at that at this point, yes or no. The nice part is we're right in the middle of, of fourth quarter. And as you know, with the spending patterns, a lot of money's coming in. A lot of agencies are, um, a lot of our sister agencies are really trying to, to manage this. Now, as we started on these analytics and we started doing a lot of this analysis and we've been talking to our sister agencies, it's all about education. You know, that's one of the things that we have put an emphasis on at DOT is to, to really let folks at highways or uh, folks at MARAD understand kind of where they are in the system, where they are with their spend. Um, knowing full well, however, that trying to do that midstream, it's hard to change acquisition strategies at this point. So we are trying to target FY22 um, as a nice uh, way to really ramp up this effort. But we wanted to give you an idea of, of where we are. Okay. So here, I thought this would be really helpful for you all to see in terms of exactly how much is being spent over five years at the different modes that we have within DOT. Now, if you notice, there's one big player missing from this. Ooh, sorry, let me go back. There's one big mode missing from this, and that's the federal um, FAA. And uh, one of the reasons is they don't have to follow the FAR. So uh, basically, they handle a lot of their procurement separately, although they do report to our um, office of the secretary and our senior procurement exec, um, they're handling their own uh, professional services and a lot of their own category management initiatives separately. Uh, totally fine. Unfortunately, they couldn't be with us today, 
Um, so I do want to, to have some transparency here with the data of what you're looking at. But as you can see, we have um, a wide variety of, of spend across the different modes. Office of the Secretary is obviously very, very high. Federal Highways, as I mentioned earlier, um, and then our National Highway Traffic Safety Administration is extremely high in these particular areas. As you're looking across the minor categories, you can see where the bulk of our spend is happening. Um, and I think this is really, really enlightening, and especially for you all as you're trying to figure out which type of opportunities to target. Um, I, we totally understand bid and proposal costs are expensive. So here's a nice overlay of where our money is being spent when it comes to professional services. And you can see, obviously, management and advisory. That's our big one, as is technical and engineering services. Unfortunately, you know, social services, not that huge for DOT. Uh, similarly with legal services, which could be a good thing, right? Depending on um, what those legal services are being used for. Um, business administration though, another big category. And then interestingly enough, marketing and public relations. Now, as we're identifying these particular trends, we're starting to sort of delve into, okay, why is it? Why is technical and engineering so, um, so important? As I mentioned earlier in the presentation, many of you have been following um, the administration's initiatives, their executive orders, and of course the big one that's pending is the infrastructure bill. I've never seen in my career um, folks who are, are following a bill maybe quite as passionately uh, as DOT will we'll be a big player if that particular bill gets passed. And obviously a lot of those um, dollars are being spent on infrastructure, which would be fall or which could potentially fall under DOT. Um, and the good news is when that happens, if it happens, excuse me, if it happens, by, def by default, a lot of professional services um, may also increase as well as we try to support some of those different types of initiatives. So it's a great time actually to be part of the DOT. It's one of the reasons why I joined the organization when I did. Um, when it comes to tier usage, uh, I thought this would be very, very interesting for you all to take a look at. You can see based on the color coding exactly, you know, I mentioned we're only about 30% uh, using sort of best in class vehicles. And you can see a lot of our tier zero is happening in the management and advisory services. So this gives us a good idea of where are there opportunities that we can hopefully rise up the tier by using certain uh, best in class vehicles or tier two vehicles that, for instance, GSA offers. All right, so these next couple of slides, and I see a lot of questions coming in, so I, I wanna make sure that I'm um, gonna give ourselves time to answer those. Um, the next several slides will actually go through the minor categories and give you some highlights. So if you are a business that's interested in business administration, for instance, you can see who the major players are, which will help you uh, monitor on the government point of entry, you know, which uh, modes are doing business in this area. And you can also see the trends. So for instance, in business admin, we've seen a 100% increase in overall spend in this category. It's actually quite interesting. And you'll notice that only 86% of the spend is in tier zero. So this is one of those places that we're gonna target. How do, we, how do we move up the tier? And then this last bullet that you see here, what we have done, and we've spent a lot of time over the last year, we actually put together a, a PowerPoint, or excuse me, a SharePoint website where all of the modes, all of the contracting officers, PMs, cores can actually visit the site. And if you have a requirement in business administration, for instance, we've done the research to sort of drive folks, you know, and help incentivize behavior by saying, hey, as you're doing your market research, perhaps consider the following uh, vehicles. You'll notice right here, we have an administrative support and clerical vehicle. It is a mandatory use. We do have some of those at DOT. Um, and we'll put in there where, when it expires. So this, this helps folks as they're trying to do their market research, they're trying to position and develop their acquisition strategy. Uh, they can see, they have a place to start. Again, it's all part of that education, educating our support staff, educating our requirements owners. Where can you find um, companies that are capable, that are already on contract? And that way we can actually access them faster. When it comes to financial services, uh, this is a, a smaller piece, about 82 million. But interestingly enough, we've had a 60% decrease in overall spend, um, but still a large part of the spend is in tier zero. And you can see there the variety of different vehicles that we uh, recommend, uh, including Oasis, and you have the different pools there. 
Uh, we also, of course, tell folks that it is mandatory for the entire government to use that particular identity protection and credit monitoring contract. Legal services, as I mentioned, we, um, we don't spend that much in this arena, uh, not like when I was working at ICE, uh, but we, and we have seen a 22% decrease in overall spend, but if you'll notice, it's a lot of tier zero. And so that's something we are looking at. And we'll talk to folks who are, uh, you know, doing the spend in that area. Uh, and we've identified the requisite GSA multiple award schedule for professional legal services. Management and advisory, as I mentioned at the, the top of the presentation, that's our biggest area. Um, we have not seen a change in overall spend, uh, but 71% is in tier zero. So an area ripe for the opportunity to, uh, to change our buying practices. And of course you can see there, we are recommending Oasis Pool 1, uh, as well as the uh, particular GSA uh, mass schedule. Marketing and public relations, interestingly enough, there's been an increase, about 11%, 345 million uh, over five years. That was a surprise to me, just um, doing some of the analytics. And of course, 90% of the spend is in tier zero. Again, great opportunity uh, for us to make some changes with our buying practices. And you can see there, we've identified for our uh, buyers, a variety of different GSA options. And it looks like uh, NHTSA is the main proponent of this particular type of work. When it comes to R&D, DOT does a lot of R&D work. Uh, it was actually fascinating uh, to learn about all of the different initiatives that we're involved in. Uh, and you can see, we have seen an increase in overall spend. This is me talking. Um, I anticipate that will, will go up, especially if the infrastructure bill gets passed. Uh, we've identified Oasis Pool 4 uh, and then a GSA multiple award schedule as well. Social services, as I mentioned, uh, not a big area for us just in general, but there has been a 1500% increase in overall spend. Uh, and so um, we have not been able to identify any best in class vehicle, uh, but this is something as we talk to other federal agencies uh, and we talk to industry, you know, if, if you guys can recommend something or if this is something that should be pursued government wide, we'd love to hear it. Uh, you know, again, any way that we can streamline our acquisition process to get to qualified, capable vendors, we're, we're all for it. Technical and engineering, uh, we've seen a 44% decrease in this particular area, but huge tier zero spending in five years. So this is something we're targeting to increase. Uh, and there again, you also see your different uh, vehicles. So with that, um, I would like to talk to you guys a little bit about some of the upcoming DOT wide contract initiatives that we have in play. Um, does not capture everything. These are, are initiatives that my particular group is working on. Um, doesn't mean to say that there aren't uh, upcoming professional service requirements from the other modes, but these were things where we thought we were right for um, really getting our spend under management. Uh, and we do recognize, and I think Bounce is going to talk about the forecasting tools that are available where you can find individual procurements from the individual agency. So with that, what I wanted to share with you guys, and hopefully you can see the, the whole screen there, we're working on something called what we affectionately call STEPC. Everything has an acronym in the federal government. Uh, and the idea here is it's services in support of technical writing, communications, editorial, presentations, and communication or STEPC. We estimate that the value of these, this type of procurement would be roughly 25 million to 50 million. We're still, um, since we are in the requirements development, you can see that down in the status, we're trying to, um, once we get our handle around that, we'll start doing some, um, we'll start doing some research and figure out what type of, should this be a set aside? Uh, if so, what type? So that's still TBD, but we are looking at a one, you know, one year plus four option year. Uh, ordering period for this. Right now we're projecting spring or summer of 2022. We anticipate that this would be a multiple award BPA and therefore would fall as a, as a tier two vehicle. Um, what's really interesting about this and then the next procurement that I'm gonna talk about briefly is our usage preference. As I mentioned, DOT is trying to incentivize uh, behavior changes you know, in our buying staff. The first begins with education. The next becomes with policy or mandatory use or preferential use of certain vehicles. So you can see here um, what we are currently, uh, really, you know, currently thinking that we're going to do is sort of say, hey, at the, at the beginning, it's gonna be 
step C, you have to consider that first. If that doesn't meet your needs, then a tier two or tier three vehicle. And then if that doesn't work, you'd have to actually request a waiver um, if neither option is viable. The reason why this is so important um, is, and these are sort of tips for, for you all as you're considering, you know, do you, I think I think all of you are um, GSA holders, uh, but if not, it's very important to get on these vehicles. It's very important to compete for, you know, any follow on uh, vehicles that the GSA is putting in place because we really are trying to uh, direct folks in a particular direction. And obviously once, and you guys have been through this, once a procurement is put in place, right now I don't see DOT playing in the arena of doing you know, on-ramps and off-ramps as you might see on like a GSA vehicle or the Oasis vehicle. Um, so something to consider when, when you're looking at pursuing opportunities. And then this next one, um, acquisition support our favorite, very near and dear to my heart, obviously. We're looking at acquisition contracting and contract closeout functions. Uh, like many of our program office counterparts, uh, we always need additional folks. And sometimes you can't always do that with a Fed. Uh, we've identified obviously the NAICS code. Now, based on how we've been procuring these services uh, via the different modes, most folks have used 8 a so we're gonna keep it in the 8 a program. Um, we haven't ascertained a, a total dollar value yet because we're still trying to get our hands around the, the scope for the next five years. Um, and you'll see that we're in the process of developing the acquisition plan. Now, as I mentioned earlier with category management, one of our ideas or, or one of our goals really is to get our hands around um, how to make it as easy as possible for our folks. So this particular procurement, you may not ever see it as, you know, we compete one vehicle with a set list of vendors and then people order off of it. What we're really trying to do is give our contracting folks a choice, but make it as easy as possible to go this route, whether you see their GSA or Oasis or potentially getting a waiver. And so it's going to fall on my team to do something like create a class acquisition plan, create class market research documents, um, anything we can do to speed up that process, to shorten that timeline, to get things on contract. That's one of our biggest goals. And one of the biggest things that we've heard from our sister agencies when they ask, you know, when we ask them, how can we help you? It's all about streamlining. Now, one of the other things I do want to quickly bring up um, before we get to some of your questions, um, Folks will ask me, well, how can industry, you know, help you? What's a good way to get our foot in the door? What do you, what do you recommend? Um, one of the things that we've been hearing, first it was anecdotally, and then in the last couple of, of weeks, now that it's fourth quarter, um, my staff is actually coming to me as buyers for FRA procurements. And one of the concerns that's being raised is, you know, we're using some of these vehicles, but we're not getting adequate competition, or at least we're surprised at the number of vendors that are competing. In the past, maybe we would, have, we would have gotten five to 10 vendors and maybe now we're getting two or maybe we're only getting one for some reason. And we go through the various checks. Was the requirement clear? How much time did you give folks? But we've also reached out to some companies as well and said, um, you know, what happened? You know, it was, what, was there something on our end? Was it you, was it me, what happened? Uh, and, and what we've been hearing, and, and I'm, I would love to hear from all of you, is folks are saying that they're struggling with the labor market and that, you know, as we enter this era, I've heard the term bandied about, about the great resignation, um, especially with professional services, companies are saying, I just can't find uh, labor, you know, or I can't find the right people to put towards this. So I'm choosing to not go after this opportunity. Um, would love to hear from you all. If, if you're experiencing that, um, we've heard from some companies who've asked us to sort of push our requirements. Could we wait until FY22, you know, when COVID's maybe more under control? Um, so I, I will tell you, our DOT modes are looking for vendors to compete on these contracts. And it's hard for me to sell category management and, and the use of some of these vehicles if my, my sister agencies and even my own staff solicit, we don't get enough competition or perhaps you know, for whatever reason, it's not working, or maybe the rates aren't, uh, the pricing that we're getting might not be what we thought. Um, then folks are like, well, I tried it. Now maybe I want to try something else uh, in open market. And so, so 
that's my my one plea, I guess, to industry is the more that you guys participate and um, and compete. And I get it, time, resources, labor. It's everybody's under the gun, um, but it will help us to to really sell this category management effort. So with that, um, I notice we still bounce. We still have about five questions, and we've got a couple, like maybe five minutes before we turn it over to Jennifer. So um, hopefully you guys enjoyed the presentation. Hopefully there was a lot of information to, to mull over. And yeah, would you, would you like to take some questions now? Sure, absolutely, Bethany. Um, okay. We got a couple good ones coming out here for you. Okay. Um, <clears throat> let's see here. Um, does DOT have a goal to increase small business spending? Um, also including set aside spending for um, women-owned small businesses and things like that. So we... Um, it's interesting. We, we negotiate our goals with the SBA, uh, similar to every federal agency. And so we, not only do we follow our specific goals, we have, I think it's 5% um, for many of our goals. I think 3% if it's hub zone, um, hub zone for DOT, we actually do really, really well on, uh, women owned small businesses. I think we also do pretty well in that arena. Um, we have a fantastic Osdebu office who every month sends us, uh, spreadsheets on what kind of progress we're making. Um, there's also every once in a while, we hear that there could be moves afoot to look at increasing small business um, universities and research institutions is another big one. Um, and there's, there's some talk about would they change the legislation. So every once in a while, we do uh, do talk about that. People are very, very interested in the small business numbers. Um, that's a priority. At the end of the day, we're obviously trying to meet at least the SBA goals that are negotiated, um, but most of the time we blow those out of the water. So that's probably the best I can, can offer for that. Awesome, thank you so much. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, so one of the uh, attendees says, uh, we currently have a mass schedule. Is it worth the effort to get on Oasis for DOT? Um, just to answer that uh, for you, Bethany, real quick. Um, unfortunately, Oasis is closed um, for the moment. It's not going to reopen again. Um, so, you know, there's no chance to get on Oasis. But GSA is planning on doing, uh, just going to advertise a little bit, another uh, services um multi-agency contract that's coming out here in the future. So keep your eyes on that. Uh, follow us on Interact for information on the new kind of, not exactly follow on to Oasis, but is the new improved Oasis contract. Um, yeah, and I, and I would tag along on that to say absolutely um, for, for whatever the follow on vehicle looks like. We have already started working with um, the, the group at GSA who's doing the recompete to make sure our requirements are included in that new vehicle. And so, yes, what, it, you know, look for those opportunities, get in on the ground floor because we're planning on using them. So it would, it would definitely behoove you guys to get on that as well. Awesome. Thanks for the promotion there, Bethany. Sure. <laughs> um, you didn't I pay me or anything, you know. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, with the administration, there's kind of a new initiative, uh, especially with inclusion and diversity. Um, yeah. Can statistics be provided on inclusion and diversity program services? Ooh, uh, could you give me more maybe clarity on that? Like, I, hmm. let me see here if the person... Um, the person that asked that question, is there um, a little bit more clarity you can actually give for that question? You know, they are, they are definitely taking the DEI initiatives, we call it DEI here, um, very, very seriously. I know, in fact, my FRA, I can speak, you know, very definitively on that. Um, we've been pursuing a number of outreach events. Uh, we've talked to, and not, forgive me, I forget their name, Comto. Um, I personally was a speaker at the Women's Chamber of Commerce event. Uh, there's been a lot of work on universities and helping them, universities and minority owned, um, or excuse me, historically black colleges and universities uh, to help them get on some of our R&D BPAs. Uh, so I don't, right at this moment, I don't personally have a lot of statistics on that, but we've even, you know, seen um, policy memos come out from the senior procurement executive uh, that that is definitely something that we want to um, explore and 
you know, and, and really take advantage of. And a lot of times, you know, we, we hear about non-traditional businesses. That's really big on the DOD side of the house. Um, you know, one could argue for, for DOT, it's sort of two sides of the same coin. Um, and the whole idea is, is how do we access uh, and make it easier for folks to do business with not only DOT, but the rest of the federal government. So they're, they're looking at a wide variety of, of initiatives and ways to bring people, um, to bring industry on board with that. Awesome. And it looks like J, uh, David Jennifer actually asked that. And um, I guess his kind of follow on is, and is, you seem to a answer that for us, Bethany. Um, they just want to understand where the opportunities for small businesses participate in management of the inclusion and diversity programs, where they can actually find them if they're interested in actually okay. um, participating in those things. Okay. Um, it is a new initiative, I believe. So I believe a lot of agencies are still trying to flesh that um, and, kind of things out. Yeah. And, and one thing um, when we have, so we actually, we're doing one for, we're building a DEI council actually at FRA. Um, and one of the, when we were looking at how we were going to, to procure contractor support for that, um, we used the MRAS service. That's a market research as a service. It's, you know, something we, we talked to our fed feds about, but GSA runs it and they help us with the market research. Um, so bounds actually, one of the things that they recommended is the HCATS, the human capital, mm -hmm. um, schedule. So that might be something to take a look at. Uh, they, the HCATS arena seems to be where a lot of folks are, are being driven to procure, procure services in support of getting those initiatives off the ground. Awesome. Well, I think that takes us up to our time here, uh, um, Bethany. I really appreciate the great information you've given us. Um, a lot of good stuff out there. Like I said, the slide deck will be available for you um, once the presentation is uh, completed. So you can look over those numbers further, um, you know, look at those opportunities. But uh, again, Bethany, I can't thank you uh, more than enough for giving us that information. I know a lot of good things um, our uh, audience will take out of that. So thank you again. Sure, you're welcome. And by all means, if there are questions that didn't get a chance to get to get asked today, I'd be happy to to have Bounce send them over, and we can send out that along with you know our particular slide deck. So thank you guys, uh, I appreciate it. I hope you guys have a great fourth quarter, and we look forward to you know working with all of you in the future. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much. Okay. Um, next, we have EPA coming up, and let me uh, get my screen here going. Okay, so next we have um, Jennifer Cranford, and uh, she's going to be uh, co-hosting with um, Brad Warwick. Uh, so let me introduce you to Jennifer real quick here. Uh, Jennifer Cranford uh, of the EPA of Office of Acquisition Solutions is the category management uh, branch manager. Um, Jennifer has spent the majority of her career with EPA, where she has served in a variety of roles related directly or indirectly to acquisition and contracting for the agency. She is currently the manager of the group that runs the EPA's category management and statistics, strategic sourcing efforts. Um, and of course, her co-host today is Brad Warwick. Um, he is currently a team lead contracting officer for EPA Cincinnati Acquisition Division. Um, before becoming a part of EPA, Brad began his federal acquisition career as a civilian in the Air Force before transitioning to the VA. His acquisition background is diverse, including such requirements as architecture and engineering, construction, information technology, and professional services. And with that, I'd like to introduce you to Jennifer and Brad, and I'll let you uh, take over. Great, thank you, Bounce. And can everybody hear me? Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you perfectly. Thank you, Jennifer. Uh, sure, of course. So hi, everyone. Good afternoon or good morning, wherever you are. Um, as John said, Jennifer Cranford from EPA, and I have Brad Warwick uh, with me also from EPA. Um, so you'll probably hear a lot of similar themes to what Bethany just went over for DOT. Um, we're going to talk with you today about professional services contracting opportunities at EPA. Um, I'll start. And I will spend some time up front going over general trends in professional services at EPA. And then Brad will come in. He'll highlight a number of prominent opportunities coming up in the next 24 to 36 months. And then I'll close with some resources, some tools, some tips for doing business at EPA, doing business with EPA that should be uh, useful for you. 
So with that, I will start on the first screen, which is, this is, and you'll see, I imagine you see similar to, uh, to uh, uh, DOT's um, overview. This is a list of the top professional services at a very high level, top professional services that uh, EPA uses. Um, these are the major categories. They might shift place from year to year, but in general, these are the top 10 that we almost always have, uh, have in our, in our you know, highest level of, of contracts that we use. Um, and so the trends in professional services over the past year and what you can see coming, um, not surprising environmental consulting services, and administrative management, general management consulting, a lot of IT, um, IT professional services, uh, facilities and construction uh, might seem a little surprising, but that's primarily our super fun work. We have a lot of super fun work, of course, all over the country. And a lot of that involves, <clears throat> excuse me, facilities and construction and engineering. And then R&D, a lot of research and development uh, that goes on both on site and in a lot of the laboratories that we have. Uh, so those are sort of the top areas of professional services for EPA. Um, to look at, uh, zooming in for a little bit, to look at the EPA just in terms of its overall size and, and footprint, much smaller than, than DOT, our total annual contract obliga obligations are about 1.5 billion. Um, to date, so far this year, so basically up through the third quarter, we spent about 555 million in professional services and approximately, excuse me, approximately 101 million in uh, spend under management uh, ser services across four, across 404 existing contracts. So we're much smaller than, than DOT, but we're still you know, definitely focusing on category management and getting work into the tiers and into the best in class, uh, best in class categories. The professional services spend under management subcategories, the main ones that we use, are management and advisory services, research and development, and business administration. And then within that, uh, we primarily rely on the professional services schedule, so GSA schedules. Uh, about 50% of all related spend is within that. And then we also are starting to use OASIS more. It took a little bit of time for us to, to start making that transition, but we are starting to use OASIS more. Um, in terms of, well, let's see, it's probably on the next slide. Here we go. So focusing on the next, say, 24 to 36 months, um, uh, upcoming opportunities that you might want to look into or you might want to prepare for at EPA, uh, we have 38 professional services contracts expiring in the next, next couple of fiscal years. Uh, the total value of those expiring, 24 million. And the average value of those expiring is 530 million. Um, the maximum value is about 5 million, minimum value about 15K. So they range in size. Um, we have a lot of orders, multiple orders planned through the best in class vehicles, uh, uh, several large requirements planned to go through OASIS, and then others to go through a GSA schedule. Um, in terms of category management, in terms of where we stand, uh, with meeting the goals that OMB sets for all of the agencies. Um, for EPA's goals, uh, we are on track to exceed the best-in-class goals that they have set for us. We're probably going to make about, if, if, if trends go as, as, expected, as expected, we'll probably make about 75% um, of the overall spend under management, so Tier 1 or Tier 2. Um, but for Tier 3, we'll, ex we'll exceed that. Um, and you know we continue to work toward the overall goal of, of, of getting up to the, the full the full hundred uh, percent that, that uh, OMB is looking for. But we are on track for moving moving forward and moving upward. And with the best in class, we're we're, uh, we're exceeding that as as uh, as of right now. Um, I want to talk a little bit about small business. Um, so in both category management and in general, EPA puts a lot of emphasis on small business. Um, we have a policy, the first consideration for small business or socioeconomic firms that can support EPA requirements and are available on a some solution, on a spend under management solution. So all things being equal, if there is a small business or socioeconomic firm um, that can do it, uh, that's the one we would, that's the one we would, we would want to go with. Um, EPA also has a waiver process in place 
if there are no such firms, if there are no small business or socioeconomic firms available on a sum solution, but they are available for very local decentralized work. Um, in that instance, we uh, have a waiver process to allow us to use, to use uh, uh, small socioeconomic firms. In terms of um, all of the other categories that go into uh, small businesses, so hub zone firms, women-owned small businesses, service-disabled veteran-owned small businesses, um, we focus a lot on meeting those goals. We almost always exceed our annual small business uh, small business achievement goals. You can see examples uh, for just this past year. Uh, our small business prime contractor goal was 35%, and we were at 38%. And uh, for subcontracting, the goal was well, the goal was 55%. The actual was lower than was lower than we wanted it to be that year. But you know, we continue to move forward. And in most of the other categories, we are uh, we we exceed. The, the goal set for us. Um, okay, so I'm gonna stop here for a second. And uh, Brad is going to talk about some specific opportunities that we have coming up in the next, uh, like I said, 24 to 36 months. We'll go over, I think about nine or 10 opportunities and then I'll come back to talk about um, uh, resources and tools that EPA provides for all businesses and for small businesses to help, um, to help find work that is a good match for you and a good match for EPA. So I will steer and Brad will, uh, Brad will talk. All right, thank you, Jennifer. Hello again, everybody. Again, my name is Brad Warwick. I'm a team lead contracting officer in the Cincinnati Acquisition Division. Of course, today I'm also representing our headquarters acquisition division in DC. Um, I will go over about nine of our upcoming requirements as uh, Jennifer noted, but uh, please note, I do want to say that these uh, requirements were provided to me from CEOs across both our headquarters and our Cincinnati division. So if you end up having questions specifically to each requirement, I may or may not be able to answer those just due to the fact that the information was provided me and I had to dig in uh, as best I could. But we will, if you do have a question, try to get back to you. Uh, if it's submitted, we'll try to get the answers to you just as a DOT will as well. So with that said, I'm going to go ahead and start with our first one. It is a requirement for Office of Grants and Debarment, or it's a mission support requirement. And as you can see uh, from the slide that we're seeking uh, contractor support, it's more along the lines of it uh, in our, our post-award monitoring situation. Uh, you know, the EPA awards approximately one half of our annual budget for grants to our states, uh, local, tribal, nonprofit, and educational partners. Um, and so this is a significant requirement for OGD. Because uh, the management of EPA's grants program, it's a very big cooperative effort between OGD within the EPA uh, headquarters and regional programs, and then the grants management officers. So a lot of hands are involved in managing this, this. So it's why we need such support from contractors to help us manage this process and ensure that the grants are being utilized properly and efficiently. Um, as you can see here, uh, under the, the next code that we just initiated this one, uh, but the current requirement has is expired. So it is definitely a pressing matter is one that uh, is considered urgent and uh, is I, my understanding is right now it's just in the RFI stages, uh, but they're moving forward very quickly. Uh, it'll be a single award GSA task order, um, but at this point it will be unrestricted full and open on GSA. Um, so that's what I have for this one. Uh, Jennifer, go ahead and um, next slide. Thank you very much. All right, next one is our sign language support. Uh, you know, the EPA prides itself on being inclusive and collaborative agency, and we're committed to meeting the needs of a very diverse staff, and not just the staff, but the general public who also interacts with our agency. So this requirement is great because it assists uh, with members of the deaf and hard of hearing community uh, to not only become employees of the EPA, but also be able to provide services, uh, translation services, so on, to, to members of the public from the agency. So it's, uh, it, it, it also helps our employees not only participate in the workforce, uh, the actual job requirements, but also fully participate in social activities, trainings, sem seminars, and really enjoy full access to all of the benefits of working at the EPA. It's a very uh, broad, supportive contract for, for the, uh, the deaf and the hard of hearing community. Uh, these essential services also allow the general public to engage in public forums that we may have with them. But as you can see, uh, it is approximately uh, a $1 million uh, contract award for a GSA task order. 
Uh, it is a single award uh, utilizing both firm fixed price and time and material uh, line items. Again, this too, uh, based on the initial research, it's gonna have to be full and open and unrestricted on GSA as well. But we continue to press in and look to see uh, for opportunities as Jennifer stated, to ensure that this, we can make as many requirements as possible to be small business set asides. Uh, based on the initial research and on historical data, uh, at this point, it's, it, our intention is to make it full and open. But again, we're, we're still researching, still looking into the market to make sure we're, we're setting this aside correctly. All right. Uh, our technical support services for the National Center of Environmental Assessment, or NCEA. Uh, the National Center, or NCEA, is a leader in the science of human health and ecological risk assessment. Uh, they occupy a critical position in the EPA, uh, specifically the Office of Research and Development. Uh, and, and between ORD um, and the researchers who are generating new findings data and the regulators in the EPA's program offices and regions. And must make you know, regulatory enforcement and remedial action decisions. So NCIA specifically prepares technical reports and assessments that integrate and evaluate the most up-to-date research and service as a major element of the science foundation supporting EPA policies. So as you can see, this can, you know, as a result, NCA plays an important role as a consultant to EPA programs across the agency uh, in order to use the science and environmental decision-making. And this also influences uh, our environmental research. So you can see here, we're seeking contractors to uh, provide support in providing the documentation and technical writings and editing of the NCA products, um, as well as supporting in, you know, it's a lot about document uh, and ensuring our documents are correct and uh, support the regulation and the policies that we may recommend as an agency. Another contractor I did want to say it is required to possess the scientific and technical knowledge associated with the requirement already in order to comply with the mandates. Uh, obviously, the, only so many contractors, at, 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 as we're aware of in the current state of market research, possess abilities to uh, that existing technical knowledge, but we, we are we in the EPA have a very strong practice of uh, submitting RFIs or source assault uh, for any of our requirements really going forward, especially something of this nature. We want to uh, broaden the base of contractor support who are available to complete requirements. So we're always searching for more, just about every major requirement that we might have. Uh, again, uh, so this one will be initiated by next May because it's not expire until May of 2023. Um, but, you know, we're always accepting, you know, uh, white pages or corporate write-ups uh, write to demonstrate, you know, capability statements and so forth. But uh, again, like I said, we have a strong history of posting RFIs or sources sought, so please be on the lookout for those. Uh, again, this one is looking to go with GSA under the next code of 541620. Um, so please be looking for any sort of initial market research that we might do. We have been working with GSA uh, with uh, what I'd say a fairly new tool, or at least within the past year or two years, we've become accustomed to using GSA performs market research often on behalf of agencies where and you may or may not be aware where they'll go and they'll reach out to uh, schedule holders, uh, contract holders and, and, and propose, you know, and we, we EPA would give uh, someone at the EPA or GSA one of our documentation that says PWS and our requirements documents and say, hey, please see if anybody else is available. We've been utilizing that tool quite a bit recently. So um, please know we're always searching for more um, yeah, contractor support just to make sure there's a broad enough base. Uh, we, we, we prefer competition and especially uh, small business set aside, as you can see from Jennifer's data, we're big on ensuring that we meet our goals. I do know that HubZone is the one, I, uh, and Jennifer, correct me when I'm wrong, which comes back on, but HubZone is one I know that we're, we're really needing to to boost up right now, we, we're pretty much hitting every other small disadvantaged business goal that the agency has set. So um, again, we pride ourselves on that and we'll continue to do so. All right, um, next slide. Thank you, Jennifer. Uh, analytical services for the Office of Compliance and Assurance or OECA, that, uh, this is a headquarters requirement. Um, I you see it talks about, you know, EPA's Office of Enforcement Clients and Assurance criminal enforcement, we're seeking contractor support to provide analytical services specifically for asbestos contaminated environmental samples in support of the uh, National Enforcement Investigation Center's environmental forensics mission. Uh, it's investigative in nature. Now, uh, please note that in addition to other certifications and accreditations, uh, contractor laboratories must have current ISO and IEC 
17025 National Institute of Standards and Technology National Voluntary Laboratory Accreditation Program accreditation, specifically for fiber asbestos analysis. Uh, now, obviously, that's a very specific requirement that would that would have to be had by anybody interested in proposing for this requirement. But please note that will be listed in the requirements document. Um, it'd be very clear in the solicitation that 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 is what will be required when this is uh, eventually posted. Again, we're going to have to initiate this by May of next year as well. We have a lot of May requirements, it seems, uh, because again, this specific current contract will expire in May of 2023. Um, this will be a total small business set aside and a uh, it's actually not be on GSA. And we conferred with uh, concurred with balance before we put this together to ensure that we didn't know if all requirements needed to be GSA specific. But uh, he said, no, we could open up some other ones just to make you aware. But this one isn't a GSA requirement unless we're able to find some uh, contractors who can meet the minimum requirements of this in our market research that we'll end up doing here pretty soon. But as of now, uh, this would be an open market purchase order that we'll end up posting. It would be on FBO and SAM, F SAM FBO. And then also we utilize uh, a website called FedConnect. So it would end up being posted on both the, the same posting. So please keep, uh, keep an eye out for that one. All right, uh, next one. This one is our earth requirement. It's called environmental analytical research, technical and hybrid support services for the Office of Air and Radiation. This also is a headquarters requirement. Um, uh, it's fairly sizable. As you can see, it's $158 million ceiling is the, the current estimate. Uh, it'll be a multiple award BPA. Obviously, uh, any call orders awarded off of these would be issued uh, between them. Now, this requirement specifically is combining 15 plus existing vehicles offering very similar services. As, as you know, across agencies, especially with the history of decreasing budgets recently, we had to become far more efficient. So uh, this will be combining these. It is not bundling, uh, that has been cleared, just so in case anybody's aware. And we've made very specific because this is an OR, OAR, or Office of Air and Radiation, wide contract vehicle for professional services uh, with focus of improving efficiencies for those programs while also increasing opportunities for small business. So as we said, this is anticipated to be a multiple award BPA. At least one of those BPAs, uh, until we've completed market research, we won't know the specific number of who's available, but at least one of the BPAs will be small business set aside. Um, we have received some responses from an RFI that was already posted. And I know that they're, the program offices are going through that now. That's as far as I can state on the specifics of the current status without getting uh, any, any sort of legal issue. But um, I will say though, that the goal is at least one BPA is set aside for small business under these very large ceilings. Um, more would be uh, hoped for, but again, we have to wait till the, uh, the submissions are fully reviewed before we can make that determination. Uh, again, that's already been initiated and it will be awarded prior to September of next year. All right, uh, next one. Oh, that also is an OASIS requirement. I did want to put that very specific. That's OASIS. So thanks, Jennifer. All right. Our uh, analytical support services for the Office of Water, specifically the Technical Support Center within the Office of Water, that is a Cincinnati requirement. Um, as you see, we're seeking a contractor who can provide the personal personnel and services required for a number of requirements here, developing and validating analytical methods, I don't want to read the slide to you, but we're providing assistance with statistical and experimental aspects of project planning. So it's a broad um, spectrum of what can be required under this. Uh, it's approximately a $7 million, mailing, uh, $7 million ceiling, but just to provide a little bit more information on the office, uh, the principal objective of the EPA's Office of Water, um, and this would fall under the Office of Ground wa Water and Drinking Water Standards, um, they exist to ensure that drinking water provided to all Americans is of sufficient quality uh, to protect the public health. So TSC specifically is located in Cincinnati at the uh, Alberg facility, and they frequently participate in joint laboratory projects with several other EPA offices, including um, the Office of Research and Development. So the majority of the support performed by TSC involves the development of analytical methods for the analysis of drinking water through exploratory and innovative activities. We kind of touched on that before. Um, therefore, there are limited or no experimental protocols available that can be provided to the contractor as guidance for the performance. So that is key. Um, now, during the execution of this performance work statement, the contractor may be required to communicate with states 
EPA regional offices, local municipalities, or even private citizens. So uh, in such cases, contractor personnel shall clearly identify themselves as a contractor employee working under the EPA. So you will have some interaction potentially even with the general public under this requirement. Um, I know this is a, this requirement in, in general has been around for quite a number of years, but um, as you can see, we're, we're getting to the point to where we initiated the uh, market research phases. It's gonna need to be completed by May of next year. Um, it is a single award contract in the open market. Again, uh, another one, not GSA. Uh, we are currently going under the GSA scope review though. So we wanna make that clear that in the past, we've not been able to go under GSA, but we are working in tandem with GSA to go out and research and uh, pretty much uh, post an RFI for GSA contract holders at this point, just to see if anything has changed within the past few years uh, in hopes that we can utilize GSA and in hopes that there is greater competition available for this requirement. Uh, at this point though, it is still unrestricted, uh, but again, we in the EPA are always willing to uh, set something aside if there are you know, two or more small businesses available. So we're, we constantly work with our internal small business office, also known as OSDABU, um, and um, we're always looking for new opportunities. So with that, um, let's go ahead and move on to the next one. Thank you very much. Uh, this is another Cincinnati uh, opportunity. It's the technical support for the implementation of unregulated contaminant monitoring rule, UCMR. Um, and drinking water standards development for the Office of Water. Uh, you know, the United States EPA, uh, Office of Water, is responsible for implementing the provisions of the Safe Drinking Water Act, uh, specifically Section 1445A2, uh, which says monitoring program for the unregulated contaminants. Uh, now, this section requires that every five years, the EPA issues a new list of no more than 30 unregulated contaminants to be monitored by public water systems. Uh, this uncontam uh, unregulated contaminant monitoring rule requires public water systems to collect uh, current data for contaminants that may be present in drinking water. Um, and so, but they're not yet a subject to the EPA's drinking water standards. So we're looking for new contaminants that may be subject to our standards every five years when this occurs. Uh, now this rule does benefit the public health by providing EPA and other interested parties with scientifically valid data on the nat natural, national occurrence of selected contaminants in drinking water. So uh, it's a pretty important requirement for the Office of Water here within the EPA as it does impact the nation as a whole. Um, you know, we're requiring con uh, contractor to conduct these studies. Uh, then it's obviously uh, technical and scientific in nature uh, and we need administrative support to go along with it. Um, obviously, you know, this new requirement, UCMR, has a few additional steps that most uh, requirements don't have in the, in the initial market research and solicitation phases, uh, because I know that you have to have certain UCMR certifications prior to being even able to um, propose to this requirement. So, but that has been posted on uh, FBO SAM. Uh, the current contract does expire in, in July, end of July of next year. That's why we started a little bit earlier for this one because of those initial, uh, the initial requirement of ensuring that we have a a, a number of certified contractors already available. So uh, it is a total small business set aside, also another open market requirement. But again, um, we've offered uh, the requirements document to the GSA to see if we can find anybody on GSA who is capable. The big key will be that certification, uh, the UCMR certification uh, specific to this requirement. Um, in case anybody's keeping count, this specifically is UCMR 5. So that's, that's what it is referring, referred to. But uh, that's it. what I have for that one. Uh, thanks, Jennifer, for the next slide. All right, this is the document and data management support. This is the last requirement I have to speak about today. It's uh, document and data management support. Uh, it has historically is a GSA requirement. It is a total small business set aside for approximately $9 million. Um, the recompete is upcoming. They've not given me a specific uh, time frame, but we generally do it at least a year out. So with the current expiration being July of 23, I would say uh, no later than July of 22, but most requirements were, were pushing earlier than that. Um, but the EPA's Office of Pesticide Programs, or OPP, is responsible for regulating the supply and use of chemical and biological agents produced, marketed, and used for pest control in the United States. 
So in carrying out the responsibilities, OPP makes thousands of discrete regulatory decisions each year. And all of these decisions are information intensive, as you can imagine. Uh, they require substantial amounts of technical information uh, from pesticide firms and other sources. So this requirement is gonna help uh, the contractor support we need for that is about capturing, processing, and maintaining that large amount of data that we need in order to make informed decisions for regulatory uh, updates or even new new regulations. Uh, so this data is specifically to pesticide regulatory applications. Um, so obviously when we post the, the RFI or the source of SOD, and then of course the following solicitation, you wanna make sure uh, just as a suggestion from a contracting officer, make sure that it's very clear in any document you submit, whether it's capability statement during the market research phase or uh, later if they end up going through the proposal phase, that your proposal would be very clear on the uh, that you meet those requirements. If it's listed in the PWS or the performance work statement that, hey, you have to have these certain certifications or experience with these types of uh, regulations, please be very clear um, in your proposal or in your capability statement that you do meet that. Um, a lot of times, and I know this is going off on the trail, but just, just speaking from a, a CO's perspective in general, not specific to this requirement is, um, if there is a requirement of a certification specifically or some sort of experience with a specific work, uh, part of the overall requirement, just make it very clear, foot stop it if you have to multiple times within your uh, documents that you submit, because especially when it comes to GSA, the vast majority of uh, solicitations that go through GSA are, are completed without discussions. So there's generally no going back to the contractors for a lot of agencies. Um, so just that's just a hint. Please be clear on things like that. That hey, we do have a certification, or hey, we 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 have we meet this requirement that you say to this specific requirement or experience. So, and with that, I am going to pass it back over to Jennifer. Uh, thank you all for your time. Again, if you have questions related to the specific requirements um, and I can't answer them, I'll happily take your questions back and get back to you. I'll provide the information to bounce. Thank you. All right, great. Thank you, Brad. Uh, so hi again. Um, and so to close us out, I want to share some tools and some resources and tips for working with EPA. Uh, I'll go over some online EPA specific resources, some federal wide tools, which you probably already know about, but I'll just highlight them and point to them. And then also some general tips for finding contracting opportunities at EPA and points of contact for any questions you might have. Um, I know GSA also has a ton of great tools, and I'm sure Bounce is going, uh, he mentioned he's going to go over some of them at least um, in the, uh, after this. So I will stick to uh, EPA and, and non GSA uh, uh, tools and tips. So let's see. There we go. So EPA um, and all of these, all of these links, all of these sites that I'm showing uh, in this presentation at the end is a list of all of the links. So I think you get a copy of this presentation, so you'll, you'll get all of these. Um, we have a number of sites that are geared specifically for helping companies find opportunities. Okay. Um, first one is contract the Contracting with EPA website. It's just a, an image of it there, but you'll see it and you'll see the link at the end of the presentation. Uh, this provides information on doing business with EPA. It includes important elements of the contracting process. It gives uh, points of contact and information on the regulations and the policies that are applicable to EPA acquisitions, which for the most part are applicable to most, most agency acquisitions, um, but, it, but also does have specific EPA information. Um, the acquisition forecast database, this is actually really powerful, a really, a really good tool. Um, EPA's program offices meet, uh, meet regularly with our competition advocate. They put together a list of their upcoming requirements. We, we post that on the acquisition forecast database. So you can check that regularly for um, information on potential, potential acquisitions. It says for the next three years, um, but really it gets updated much more frequently than that. So I would say definitely you can check that to look for um, any sort of work at EPA. Um, it is uh, searchable by office, by region, by dollar range, by NAICS code, et cetera. So it's a, it's a pretty good tool to use. Um, the EPA active contracts list also, I would say, is a very useful tool. It lists all active EPA contracts, um, and it can be filtered in any variety of ways, especially, for example, you know, if you want to filter it by expiration date, so you know which contracts are ending soon, you can search by NAICS codes, you can search by vendors. Um, that's a very useful tool just to get an overall picture of, okay, 
where, where are these contracts that I might be interested in? Where are they in their life cycle at EPA? Um, so that's, that's a good tool to know about as well. Um, resources for small business in particular. So our Osdebu office, like uh, you know, uh, Bethany mentioned hers, and and uh, and and uh, we talked a couple minutes uh, earlier about ours. But the Office of Small and Disadvantaged Business Utilization it also provides resources specifically for small businesses. Um, there are a number of, uh, and so you'll see the links there, and you'll see the links at the end of the at the end of the presentation. Uh, there is something called the uh, Vendor Program Management Database System, Osdebu, uh, EPA Osdebu is starting uh, next fiscal year, and that'll be available to all small businesses to register with. Um, you can register your, your interest in, in particular types of work, and you can also upload your capability statements, um, and that's available uh, through the Osdebu office, and they'll be the ones running that. We work very closely with, with our Osdebu office. They also hold frequent vendor outreach events, uh, much like this one, but specifically for small businesses. Um, and that you know they do it based on a variety of of, uh, of areas, whether it's the performance area or whether it's the type of type of small business. Um, if you get connected with our Osmo office, they will uh, you can get on their mailing list and they'll let you know when those when those outreach efforts are are coming up. Um, Let's see. Next, these are tools you're probably already familiar with, but I just thought I would point them out. FedConnect is the web portal that uh, streamlines communications between EPA and current or potential contractors uh, for all procurement actions. So we use FedConnect. And then SAM.gov, I'm sure you know, that's just the centralized listing of all contracting opportunities. That's where you register. If anyone is very, very new, if you haven't already registered with SAM.gov, that's your very first step in doing, doing business with the federal government central repository and starting place basically for all things related to uh, contracting with the, with the federal government. Um, and then I want to talk a little bit about uh, about working with EPA. This is probably applicable to most agencies, but I thought this might be useful just to share with you. Um, it takes work, especially for those of you who might be new to this. It takes work to, to break into the market like any market. Um, many aspects of it are highly competitive. Um, and in general, the federal government does make you go through a few more hoops than, than just working for a private company. Um, so you need to do your research. You need to make sure that your proposals and marketing efforts are hitting their mark because uh, it's, it's, you know, it's expensive to go through all of that work for you. Um, there's not an easy one-size-fits-all approach, but there are some good solid approaches to researching, preparing to, to compete for EPA work. And it comes down really to understanding the need and being able to show how your company can meet it best. So you need to understand the organization and the work and, and the best ways to do that, especially if you're first starting out, um, you know, look, look on the agency's websites, check the organization charts, see how the various programs work together and see what their most current and pressing and important programs and projects are. Um, obviously industry and government publications. Um, you can identify existing contracts where you would be a good fit, and there are lots of ways to do that. You can look at the GSA schedules, best-in-class vehicles, existing contracts with subcontracting sub opportunities, because obviously, you know, being a prime contractor is one way to do work for the government. Being a sub is another way, and, and that might be more, more, more common, more frequent in some cases. Um, networking with current contractors, <coughs> excuse me, um, looking for opportunities to partner or collaborate. Find out who the current EPA uh, vendors are and, and network with them. Um, and then, of course, have a specific government marketing strategy. So, if you have a company website, you want to make sure that it includes a government section so you can talk about you know, your case studies, your, the work that you've done previously, all of the required government information. You can put it right there, um, highlight any agency specific work that you've already done, <clears throat> excuse me, and find the most relevant contacts and, and learn about their needs and their programs. Um, also, there are a few, uh, a few um, good tools if you're interested in subcontracting specifically, and those are listed in the, the, the box on the right, um, SBA's subnet database. It's a database of subcontracting opportunities. They also have a directory of uh, federal uh, government prime contractors with subcontracting plans, so that you know, gives you some information. And uh, GSA, I bounce might talk about this, GSA has a subcontracting directory. And that's for small businesses who are seeking subcontracting opportunities that then prime contractors or, or potential prime contractors can look to, to to find people to work with, find and find 
uh, companies to work with. So with that, we are just about done. I will um, be happy to answer any questions. Here's the uh, resource, the reference list, all of the links that we had shown in our, uh, in our presentation. Here's our contact information. Uh, you can feel free to contact us or if, you know, if, uh, any of the other appropriate, uh, appropriate contacts if you want to speak with somebody. Um, and with that, I will open it up to questions, bounce if, uh, if there are any questions, if you want to, um, if you want me to answer them. Maybe we'll Absolutely. Order. Okay. Uh, thank you, Jen. First off, thank you, Jennifer and Brad. That was a great presentation. Um, I really love the tips. I think those should be given to, you know, all our new uh, contractors to the government. I think those are really, really good things to really know. And also for some of our industry partners that have been in government um, for a while, maybe it's something to take a look at and refresh ourselves. Um, but a couple of questions did come in. Um, one of them, I think it's referring to one of the slides, Jennifer. It is, um, is the 101 million in some anticipated over FY21 or what has been captured under spend so far? So is the 101 million the anticipated amount for FY21 or is it just um, how much it is currently? Can I go back and look at the slide? Absolutely. Okay. <laughs> that's to date. As a matter of fact, that's to date for fiscal year 21. So that's right. how much so far in fiscal year 21. Awesome. Thank you so much for that. And um, another question is, um, is um, what historically black uh, colleges and universities do you have um, uh, memorandums of understandings with? It's a good question. I know we have some, just off the top, this is just anecdotal. So the place to get the full answer to that question is probably our Osdebu office. I know just because I happen to know, um, I know that we work with Howard University um, somewhat frequently, um, but again, that's just one I happen to know. Um, I know we have others. And if you want the full answer, I can get it for, for, for you from Osdebu or you can contact them directly. Awesome. Thank you so much for that, Jennifer. And I think these are uh, a couple questions are directed to you, Brad. I don't know if you would know the specifics for these, but um, for the uh, Environmental Analytics Research Technical Hybrid Support Services, the Earth One, um, for the Offices of Air and Radiation, do you happen to know what pool specifically that's going to be in? Or just right now, it's just going to be under the OASIS contract? Right now, I don't know the specific pool at this point. I know that they were in the in the current research phase, the archive phase of it. So um, I can dig up an answer though and see if the contracting officer has made that determination yet. Okay, awesome. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. um, other than that, that's the all the questions we have so far. Um, of course, there's more come in, um, and, and of course, more technical questions regarding the actual. Um, opportunities shown, we can definitely forward those to EPA and they can definitely uh, uh, see if they can gather the answers for us and send them back and we'll definitely post them to the public so that everybody can see. Uh, but again, I would like to thank uh, Jennifer and Brad for an awesome presentation on um, EPA and their forecasting. Um, so now I'm actually gonna take over here for a moment. Uh, do you mind stop uh, sharing here, Jennifer, for a second? Awesome, thank you so much there. All right, uh, so next up uh, is me personally, and uh, let me share my screen here. Okay, awesome. So um, I should be sharing my screen. Um, so what I'm gonna talk about is um, some of the forecasting tools available to you, um, especially for our newer industry partners that may be joining the call. These should be useful for you to kind of get an idea of what direction to go to, what's out there when it comes to opportunities for the government. Um, I'm just gonna go briefly over them and um, all the links are provided in the slide presentation, which will be given to you after this. Um, so you can click on any of these links and go to these websites that I do talk about uh, with these tools and dashboards. So let me go ahead and get started here. Um, so the first uh, tool I'm going to be talking about is uh, GSA's own forecast of contracting opportunities tool. Um, now, these are opportunities that are listed from the General Services Administration, Department of the Interior, and Department of Labor. Uh, now, this is one of our most popular uh, tools that we have. Um, how you get to it, of course, is through our acquisition gateway. Uh, the two links on the slide deck here will take you directly to that. Um, once you do click on the links, uh, it does take a little bit of time to actually for the page to come up because there is a lot of data 
um, contained within this. So, uh, you know, be a little patient and give it some time once it does pop up. But as you can see on the left side here, I just took a screenshot of what should first pop up when you actually um, go to this website. Um, as you can see, it's uh, basically uh, a forecasting opportunities. Uh, these opportunities are posted from these uh, agencies that I mentioned before. And on the left side, it actually gives you uh, places to actually search for specific opportunities. You can use uh, NAICS code, maybe a specific agency, maybe you're um, place of performance, you can only work in a certain area, you can put that in there also. It also has a keyword search function in there. So you can, if you're looking for a specific, you know, hey, I'm professional services. So type in professional services. Um, it could uh, break down all the professional services opportunities out there for you. Um, so go ahead, um, go into this. Uh, if you haven't so far, fool around with it, do whatever searches you want under NAICS code or agency, whatever, you can't break it. Um, but this should help you to see what kind of opportunities are out there. And the following pages kind of, kind of show you once you do put in a specific NAICS code and you do click on an opportunity, what do you exactly see? So what do you see? Um, you'll see a listing ID, a description of the services themselves, um, and other relevant information like NAICS code, what the estimated contract value is, you know, what the current year's work. And maybe one of the most important things is kind of a point of contact or point of contact email so you can get further information on where this um, possible opportunity might be advertised and things like that. So, um, you know, this is a really great tool. Um, it's used, you know, across the government by our industry partners. Um, go ahead, take a look at it, see what kind of opportunities are out there really easy to use. And I also want to mention all the tools that I'm showing you today, um, they're a public facing. So you do not have to have an account or register for anything. Um, you should be able to just click on the links and it should directly take you directly to these website and you can start working on them um, as soon as you get to the website. So um, as you can see here, um, and of course the information here sometimes won't be filled out. It just depends on how much information uh, the actual um, see how horror put this together has um, and it could be updated uh, throughout time um, so pay attention to this um, but it should uh, give you a good idea of what opportunities are out there for you um, the next tool i'm going to talk about is um, our uh, awards exploration tool so what is this tool exactly and how can our industry partners um, use it and how can it help with their forecasting um, so we can actually explore contract data and their tier ratings, uh, tier ratings on existing contracts um, identify opportunities um, for government-wide. Um, the big thing here, I think this third bullet is really important, identify expiring contracts. And that's where the key kind of focus is um, when it comes to forecasting. Um, so all the information that the awards expiration tool uh, has is directly fed from FPDS um, data. Um, it's usually refreshed daily, so that information is really new. Um, you should have updated information if you want to go on there on a daily basis. Um, but this tool is really good in the fact that um, it takes FPDS information. It can tell you when contracts are due to expire and a possible recompete for that specific contract. Um, so that's when you would fit in is that um, you can identify a contract, looks like it's going to expire. Um, you can say, hey, is there a possible recompete? Um, and there could be contact information on that specific uh, contract, which you can contact the CEO and ask them, hey, uh, is there a possible recompete in the future? So this uh, tool can actually help um, our industry partners create their own forecast, kind of focus on um, you know, where they want to look at, um, is there a specific agency? You know, they can go out and say, hey, uh, you know, what contracts are expiring in FY22 and things like that. Um, because what this tool does, I'll show you on the next page once you go into it, it has a lot of filters which you can put in. Um, this just gives you kind of a brief description of all the filters uh, that they have. Um, once you go into the actual awards exploration tool, there's going to be a lot more things that you can implement or, you know, things that you don't really want to implement. You can make the filters however you want to get more specific. Um, for yourself. Um, the good thing too is, as you can see on the screenshot, it also tells you dollars of obligations and you can specify specify that by um, agency, um, you know, spend for specific offices and things like that. So this is a really great tool, not only to 
get potential forecasting opportunities, but just where generally where spend has going, where it's kind of leaning towards. Um, so it, it really gives you a good idea. Um, once you do filter out the information, it will show up in a nice chart. And what you can do with that is actually further click on a button um, where you can actually download it to an Excel file um, and create pivot tables and whatever you want to do to manipulate that uh, data so that actually works for you. So this is in conjunction with all the other tools. This should actually help you kind of develop uh, a forecast and see uh, potential recompetes that might be coming out in, uh, in the future. And another tool here uh, that I like to speak about is uh, the agency recurring por uh, procurement forecast. So this is uh, not exactly a tool, it's more of a website. And it's a collection of data from various agencies. Um, I have just shown eight here, but in total there are 22 different federal agencies, including both defense and civilian agencies on this actual website. Um, so if you click on that website, it's kind of nondescript. Um, it will just show a, a number of, I tried to get a screenshot of it, but it didn't turn out so well. That's why I'm not really sharing it. Um, but once you click on uh, the link here, you'll see it. It's got a nondescript website. Um, it will have a listing of the agency on the left and a link to that. Um, so if you click on that link, it will take you directly to that agency and whatever forecasting tools they have available for you. Um, some agencies are more robust in that areas than others. Um, so be aware of that. Um, but the first link, if you click on it, will be USA uh, AID. Um, if you click on their link and their kind of forecasting link, um, it's a great website. Um, not only does it give you information on upcoming webinars that they're doing when it comes to forecasting, um, you can sign up for an email list. Um, so USAID is really out there to really promote their forecasting and really help our agency partners get prepared for what's out there. So um, this is one of those things that just go ahead and dive in, uh, look at the list, uh, whatever agencies interest you. Um, if you can't find much forecasting information on the links, um, the other good thing about it is that the, those links also have actual contact information. So you can actually contact, um, you know, the local small business administration for these agencies just to ask them, hey, you know, do you have information on opportunities maybe coming up? Or do you have links to maybe a forecasting tool you have or some other resources and information that they can find? Um, so this is a really good list of just other agencies and where they kind of store their uh, forecasting information if they do have any. And last thing I'm going to talk about is just, um, you know, these are not uh, kind of, you know, I was doing this presentation, I asked around, and uh, GSA's Assistive Acquisition Service was kind enough to just to give me a couple uh, things that they're looking at doing um, under the Professional Services Program. Um, so if you want to take a look at this list, this is a great list, uh, kind of tells you, um, I think there's five opportunities in total out here. So um, and all these opportunities are either going to come out on the multiple award schedule or the OASIS uh, contracting program. So be aware, look out for those. Um, and if you have any questions on any of the opportunities, please reach out to me and I'll see if I can find some more information on them. Um, I know uh, when I did get this list, they were still in the planning uh, stages with a lot of uh, a lot of this uh, stuff. So um, at this point, they could have a lot more new information. So if you want to find out more further information, I can see if I can get a contact um, for this to, to see um, when these actual opportunities will be advertised uh, to the public, either on, uh, you know, a SAM.gov or, um, uh, you know, uh, our eBuy or other GSA uh, contracting uh, vehicles. And in closing, I do want to promote a couple things that we are currently working on. Um, so uh, right now, as you know, uh, Sam has, uh, Beta Sam has become uh, Sam.gov now. Um, but of course, uh, with Sam.gov, we're still continuing to make improvements on it. So we actually need testers for it. So if you have availability, I believe uh, the um, testing will take about 30 minutes. Uh, please register and uh, see if, uh, you know, if the times work for you. Um, but we need as much input as uh, from our industry partners as we can. You know, with these initiatives that we have coming out, especially with category management and everything that we're doing in government, we want to be as transparent as we can. So, uh, so that uh, includes with industry, so we want industry to give us feedback so that we can make the systems um, user-friendly, uh, not 
not only for our customer agencies, for our industry partners um, also. Um, but other than besides the closing, um, I do have some time for some general questions about my presentation or forecasting or supplier success strategies in general. Um, does anybody have a specific question they would like uh, for me to answer? And let me just check out what we have um, right now. Uh, let's see. I have, let's see. Let's see, this is a great question from uh, Leanna. Um, on the acquisition gateway forecast of contracting opportunities, I'm noticing that only GSA, DOI, and DOL are utilizing this tool. Will there um, be more departments joining and posting to this site in the future? That is a great question. Uh, you know, we're hoping, um, I don't, um, personally, I don't know at this point, but we're hoping that there can be um, in the future some central centralized repository um, for all our agencies to put in for a forecasting so that, um, you know, there's one area where industry partners can go instead of running around to multiple agencies trying to find out, okay, where's your forecasting tool? Hopefully in the future, we can establish one type of forecasting tool or at least something where it links to the agency so that you can actually easily see their forecasting. Um, but that is a great question and we're working on it. We're trying to make things a lot more easy, uh, user friendly for our industry partners out there. All right, uh, any more questions here? Sure, good question. Um, Bounce, can you explain the concept of uh, government-wide government category management? So that's a, that's a really broad question, but just to give it to you uh, kind of a, a short synopsis of it, uh, Bonnie. Um, so what government-wide uh, uh, category management is exactly is that we are trying to manage spend. Um, there are multiple tiers when it comes to contracting. There's a tier zero, a tier one, a tier two, and tier three. And what we're trying to do is, is take that tier zero spend, which you can essentially say is open market uh, buys, and move it either to one, two, or three. Uh, one, two, or three, uh, Contract uh, tier one are usually um, internal IDIQs that um, that uh, agencies are specifically mandated to use um, for their buys. Um, tier two is example for that is uh, GSA's multiple award schedules contract, where it's an agency wide contract which anybody can use. And then uh, our tier three is the best in class contract, where is it is uh, considered um, best in class because of the data we are able to collect, um, especially the prices paid uh, data information. So those are kind of the tiers of spend. So what the main goal of category-wide uh, category management, and it looks like Stephanie hopefully is uh, going to supply some links there um, because it is uh, quite lengthy. But um, what we're trying to do is just move all that tier zero spend over to one, two, and three. That way we can actually manage the spend, um, see where the spend is going, make sure that, and you know, we are using the tax uh, um, payers dollars wisely um, because you know with tier zero contracts there's a lot of duplication that goes on and a lot of resources to actually come up with uh, you know creating those tier zeros so hopefully that work is being able to be done either in tier one two and three and so why double up on that so that's why we want to um, actually move all that zero tier spend to one two and three so that kind of gives you just a gist of it's essentially spend it on management. We wanna manage uh, our spend, make sure we're not wasting taxpayers' dollars, um, and that it benefits um, everybody, not only our small businesses, but just makes the whole um, operation for our industry and our agencies, uh, partners, um, a lot um, easier to, um, you know, uh, uh, monitor their spend and where they're going. Um, let me see here. Um, I don't see any more questions at this time. Um, so let me just put up, and we're actually at the end of our uh, program here. Um, but real quick, um, if you want to follow us anywhere, uh, you know, especially the professional services, uh, please follow us here. Uh, we are on Twitter and we are also on LinkedIn. So if you want um, updated information on kind of events that are coming up, 
or like this uh, event, which will be posted on JSA Interact. Um, once all the slide deck and the video recording is put together, it will be posted on Interact. Um, that Interact link will be uh, supplied to the social media, so you can click on that and actually directly go to this information. So please follow us on those social media um, platforms. There's a lot of great information, a lot of great links to uh, um, professional services and category management initiatives that GSA is currently doing. And of course, my contact information is right here. Um, so if you have any questions um, on the forecasting event itself, any further questions down the road, um, please, um, you know, uh, contact me. And it doesn't even have to be about forecasting. Um, if you want to talk about, you know, how uh, the supplier relationship uh, relationship is working with um, industry and agency uh, communication and things we can improve, improve on, please, please uh, reach out to me and I'll definitely uh, set up something with you and we can definitely meet and maybe flesh out on some ideas on how we can actually improve the process and see what is working for you and what exactly is not working for our industry partners. Um, but other than that, uh, I just want to wrap up uh, this uh, webinar. I would like to thank uh, EPA and DOT again, some great presentations with some great information. Um, I want to emphasize that the, uh, the slide deck will be shared with you uh, at the uh, end here. Um, we will distribute it via email that you registered with. All the links that you saw, all the websites we went to will be active within uh, the slide presentation. Um, but other than that, I hope you have a great day and I uh, hope you're enjoying your summer weather out there. Um, other than that, I'm signing off and uh, thank you very much for attending today.